I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith, so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind. It is not arrogant. Or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but it rejoices with truth. Love bears all things. <laughs> Believes all things. Hopeful things. Endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now, we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide. These three, but the greatest of these is love. 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 You know, it's, it's easy to see that video. I've watched it a number of times even before we showed it last week and on social media this week and, and feel inspired, feel your heart lifted. And I, I hope that's true for you. You should. In fact, uh, um, it was posted and I shared it on uh, social media this week. And uh, one, of the, one of the good things, I think, about uh, social media and Facebook is that a, a high school friend of mine, who I haven't talked to in a long time, reached out to me with a direct message and said about that video and about that passage that was so inspiring. What does it mean to be inspired? And I think we hear these words, the soaring chapter of the Apostle Paul of 1 Corinthians 13. We read it every wedding, a Christian wedding, and even people who aren't people of faith hear those words and feel, they're, feel inspired. But, you know, for the Corinthian Christians, for the people that Paul first wrote this to, the church in Corinth, before they were inspired, I think they also felt the sting of it. They felt that there was some bite to those words. Because Paul didn't pen this incredible chapter uh, to encourage them for how well they were doing at loving each other. He wrote it to accuse them, quite frankly, to challenge them, to confront and convict them about how, in many ways, they were unloving toward each other. And I think before we really should be inspired in an abstract way, maybe we also need to be confronted a bit, convicted, even challenged a bit. Remember, Paul's not writing. This chapter, which you hear, he's not talking about high uh, uh, you know, philosophy or an abstract th theory. He's talking about a very personal and practical reality. That's what love is. And he's answering the question, which we asked last week and we'll ask again every week of this series, what does love look like? What does love look like? Not what does love feel like. That's what pop songs are for. But what does love look like? Be, what does love actually do? Last week I gave you this definition of love. I want to give it to you again uh, just so you can hear it. We'll talk about it each of the weeks. But love, according to Paul, Jesus, and the words of the Bible, is a determined purpose to act in such a way as to bring about the well-being of another person, regardless of how they respond or what it may cost you. A determined purpose a settled resolve to act in such a way as to bring about somebody else's good, regardless of how they respond to that or what it costs you. Let me give you an illustration. Love does not, it's not how do we feel, it's what does it look like and what does it do. In my own marriage, we, uh, we've, some of you know the five love languages uh, that are fairly popular, a book written about, called The Five Love Languages, written about these, that we each have a way that we express and we receive and feel love. And we tend to express love in the way that we feel love. And so my, two of my love languages are words of affirmation and physical touch. My wife, her two primary love languages are 
acts of service and quality time. So you probably see where this is going. I tell her that I love her and I uh, it, it, it tell her she's beautiful and I think she appreciates that, but what she needs from me is to serve her, to do acts of service and spend time. And that's, that illustrates the point I think we're seeing here. Love isn't just talk, it's action. It's what we do. She never says talk is cheap to me, by the way. Uh, she never, she's very gracious, but I think I'm learning what it really means to love is what you do. And over the next five uh, verses, Paul's going to spell out in very clear detail what love really looks like. And so we're going to spend this week and three more in just four or five verses unpacking these together. Let me read to you 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 through 7. And we'll only talk about verses 4 and 5 here this morning. Paul says, Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. It's very interesting to me that when Paul goes here to talk specifically, we last week looked at the first three verses, and in those first three verses, Paul talks about how, what, that why love matters. That doesn't matter how gifted you are, how talented you are, how successful you are, how faithful you are, how much you do, even if you do it religiously for God, if you don't have love, it amounts to nothing, it produces nothing, and you are nothing without love. Then he goes on to describe what love actually is and does, and he gives as many negatives, even more negatives, as he does positives. He describes it in terms of what love is not. I've thought about this this week. Why? I think some things are so profound and so beautiful that you almost can best describe them by explaining what they're not. And part of the wisdom of this is that every one of us as a human being hear this list of the things that love does not do or is not, and we immediately relate to that. Because I can be rude and resentful and irritable and proud and envious, and boastful, and probably you can as well. Each of these little descriptions in the negative that Paul gives, they all center around a central theme, if you will, or a way of living, a way of being in the world that is not love. And I've been thinking about an image that we could use to, 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 to describe this, that we'll, and I'll get to that in a minute. So I want to talk to you about what love is. Because Paul gives us a couple of qualities of what love is, and we'll talk about this again next week. And also, I want to talk about what love is not. Because that's where Paul spends a good bit of time here. What love does not do, what it does not look like. And and the image I want to use um, for what love is not is the image of a black hole. I wasn't very good in science. I liked uh, philosophy, history, uh, theology, poetry, you know, and uh, sports. But that wasn't all that great in science. Um, but I, and I, so I looked up science for kids online to get definitions of the black hole that I could understand. And I was thinking, how do I draw a black hole? So I'm going to do my best here to draw a black hole. Black holes apparently are not actually visible in the universe, but we know they exist based on their effect on the things around them. We'll get to that in a minute. But this is how often you see a black hole illustrated in the science textbooks for kids anyway. A black hole is this singularity at the center that sucks everything into itself. There we go, that's a black hole. And it's the singularity down at the center. Whoop. Drawing and talking is hard. But there you go. So a a black hole is, um, just a quick quick definition, it is a region of space where matter has collapsed in on itself. It's the uh, densest, uh, it has no surface area like a planet or a star, but it's the densest thing in the universe. Uh, Five billion times the density of the sun is an average black hole. Anything that gets near to it is sucked in and literally unmade destroyed because of the the powerful forces of the gravitational, the density of the gravity in a black hole. Every object in in the universe has gravity. You have gravity, I have gravity, we have a gravitational pull, but we're so small, we don't really realize that. But there's, there's a gravitational pull that holds things together. And the black hole is the, is, the, is the most powerful demonstration of this. And we're told that uh, at the center of a black hole is the singularity. Everything reduced to this spot. Um, and I think, spiritually speaking, that's the self. 
That's what Paul's saying here. There's a singularity at the center. And that it's pulling everything into itself. And we'll, get, we'll talk about these things here in just a minute. Nothing can escape the gravitational pull of a black hole, not even light. That's why we call it a black hole. And I think this is a pretty good illustration or metaphor for what it means to, to be unloving, for the opposite of love, for what the Bible calls sin. Uh, Martin Luther coined a phrase in Latin, homo incurvatus in se, H- uh, humanity curved in upon itself is the essence of sin. It's a good description of a black hole as well. Interestingly, you cannot see a black hole, but you can observe what it happens to the, to the objects around it. Its impact on stars, planets, and bodies in the heavens uh, and around it. You can tell its impact. So let me ask this question. When people get close enough to your relational orbit, they get inside your gravitational pull. What's your effect on them? What, what do they experience? So let's look at these negative qualities that Paul gives us here. Let's go briefly through these and talk about them. The first thing he says is that love does not envy. It's not envious. Your your translation might say jealous. It does not envy. What does that mean? How does it make you feel when somebody else does really well? When you see somebody receiving blessing or having good fortune or succeeding... And I'm not talking about the person that you love dearly or you care about or your best friend or your spouse or family member. Maybe somebody that you don't like all that much. Maybe somebody who's wronged you. How do you feel when you see them doing really well? Can you celebrate the good fortune and blessing of another person, even a person that you might not like? Or do you find yourself thinking, well, why, why, why isn't that happening for me? Dorothy Sayers says that envy begins by asking the question, the the valid question, why should I not enjoy what others enjoy? And envy ends by demanding, and why should others enjoy what I may not? There's an ugliness in this. What about when your life is really hard? Maybe you say, yeah, yeah, I love, I like to see other people succeed. I have no problem with that. But what about when your life is hard, when you're struggling? How does it make you feel when others are not? Love recognizes that the good fortune of another person does not diminish my, me at all. It's not a zero-sum game. It's not like if they are getting blessed that somehow I'm missing out. That's the heart of envy. That's not love. A great example of this comes from my own experience here at Chapel Street Church over the years. I've been a pastor here for over 20 years. Uh, and I, I came here as a high school youth pastor. I did all kinds of other uh, uh, roles. And Pastor Brian was the lead past senior pastor and my boss for many years. And he began to give me opportunities to preach. And one of the things that I admire most about his leadership is he was never threatened by another person's success. When I began to preach and people began to say nice things about it and God began to use it and we began to see that I had that gift, never once did I sense that he was envious or that he was pulling back. I talked to a friend of mine who's a pastor at a different church at that time. We were both youth pastors. And I was telling him about the opportunities I was getting. And he said, you don't know how rare that is. I said, what do you mean? He says, he says, guys in the senior seat don't often share the pulpit that often because they're threatened and they're envious. That's not love, Paul says. And that's the kind of leader I want to be and I want our church to be. But we're not envious of each other. We celebrate when others do well. So Paul says love does not envy. The next thing he says, it, it does not boast. Boasting. You might think, well, I'm not a braggart. That's not really my issue. But what, is, what does he mean here? Love does not boast. The Greek uh, uh, word is preparos. It literally means self-promoting, constantly talking about themselves, always turning the conversation. Remember, it's being sucked in with a great sucking sound, like when, you, when someone's having a conversation and you're trying to find a way to turn it back to you. I heard a friend who jokingly said, that person could walk into a chemo ward and talk about their flu shot. It's always about themselves, right? It's always about what, what's going on in their life. The black hole syndrome. And Paul says that love is not arrogant or proud. These three kind of go together. That love is not arrogant. And the word there is literally, the Greek word literally means puffed up. Inflated view of yourself. Inability to see or acknowledge other people and the value in others. These two things, 
envy and boast and arrogance, these three things go together and they produce behavior that is inevitably what Paul says is rude. Love is not rude. It's not inconsiderate. And it, it, if somebody is envious, boastful, and arrogant, they are inevitably going to be rude. Not because they're necessarily trying to be, because they can't help it. Because they're so self-absorbed and so focused, they, they can't see anything else. They can't do, behave any other way. So Paul is telling us this image here. Maybe we could say it like this. Two kinds of people. Uh, that w- people who walk into a room, there's two kinds of people. Those who say, here I am. Let's talk about me. And those who say, ah, there you are. I've been waiting to talk to you. I've been looking for you. Tell me about you. Honestly, as a pastor, I try to be the kind of person who says, there you are. But if I'm honest in my own heart, I'm often the kind of person who wants to be, here I am. Look at me. And it's a sickness, really. This is the image, right? Curved in on myself. Pulling all things toward me is not love. And then he says, love does not insist on its own way. I'll just put the word own way up here. I got to be, this one is a hard one for me. Demanding my rights, insist on its own way. Literally the Greek reads, does not, love does not seek its own, or love does not seek itself. Love is willing to lay down its rights. Love is willing to let somebody else have their way, and if you think you're right. Love does not say or think things like this, but I deserve this. Why can't they see that I'm right if they would just listen to me? Then he says, love is not irritable. I didn't even want to put this one up here. Love is not irritable. It's not easily angered is another way of translating this. Love is not touchy. Are you the kind of person who someone has to walk around on eggshells around where they're nervous about how you'll respond all the time? Doesn't take much for you to be offended. That's not love, Paul says. Now, okay, as far as irritability, some of you with young kids at home who are just trying to survive each day uh, in quarantine, you get a bit of a, you get extra grace on this one. But you can tell what's important to a person by what makes them angry. You can see what, what really matters to somebody is what gets, their, their, gets the rise out of them. What makes you angry? What gets you hot under the collar? Is it when somebody's wasting my time? Don't we know how valuable my time is? And last, Paul says, it is not resentful. The NIV says it keeps no record of wrongs. That's what the word literally means. It's the Greek word that means to keep an account of. And it's talking about love does not keep a list of the people who have done it wrong. (laughs) You know, you watch the movies or TV shows and there's always that guy who was bullied in high school and he's got that list, right? You just made the list, buddy. You you did me wrong. Your name goes on the list. Sometimes there actually is a list. Paul says with love, there's no list doesn't mean that you let people walk all over you or you don't know when someone hurts you. It just means you're not walking around in your soul with this record of all the wrongs done to you, resenting people. C.S. Lewis wrote, uh, resentment is like uh, drinking poison and hoping the other person dies. Resentment and unforgiveness, holding on, making a list, and defining people by it is like drinking the poison and hope that the other person dies. It only makes you sick. Paul says, with love, there's no list. Love is selective about what it holds on to. Let me explain that. Love is selective about what it remembers and what it holds on to. Are you the kind of person, am I the kind of person, who remembers and holds on to the good in someone? Or are you the kind of person who holds on to that one unkind thing they said, that one unloving thing they did, and you forget the good? When you hear about the fall of somebody else, when you hear that somebody has had misfortune or they, they, they did something terrible, what's your first reaction? Are you the kind of person who immediately thinks, well, they probably had it coming? Oh, yeah, I kind of knew. I kind of saw that about them. Are you the kind of person who thinks about the struggle and the pain and the difficulty in their life that led up to that fall? I'm not excusing it. 
speaking about these things, Paul is saying, this is what love is not. And they're all right. It's all about myself. It's all being pulled in toward me. That's an awful way to live. It's an ugly way to live. Paul then gives us a number of things that love is. We're only going to look at two of them because there are only two listed in verse 4. He tells us what love is. He says that love is patient and kind. The word patient means long-suffering. And that love is kind. Let me put it this way when it comes to patience. Love has plenty of time to give. Love has time for you. Love's not in a hurry. Love's not going, let's, get, let's wrap this up. Could you get to the point? This is convicting to me. I'm doing this a lot in my mind, all the time, thinking about, is this an efficient use of time? Is this person worth my time? Think about that question for a minute. Have you ever thought that? Is this really worth my time? Worth my time? How convicting is that? Paul says, love isn't like that. Love sees somebody as, yeah, they're worth your time. That's how God looks at you. And then love is kind. The Greek word here is a combination word of the word for goodness and the word for usefulness. We don't have an English equivalent to this. Paul's saying, it's not just kindness, like it's nice, that love is nice, but that love is good and useful, expressing something toward you. Um, Meaning, Love says, how can I help you? Love says, how can I serve you? Love says, what can I do for you? That's what the word kindness means. I, I want to do something for, for you. Remember the definition of love? The settled conviction and desire and commitment to work for another person's ultimate well-being, regardless of how they respond or what it costs you? That is love. The questions love asks are, how can I serve you? What can I do for you? How can I help you? All right. Now, anybody at this point feeling a little bit convicted? Anybody at this point feeling a little bit like, oh, this is great. I just, I already knew I wasn't that great a person. Thanks for this, Pastor Jeff. Now I get to feel terrible for the rest of the week. I, I, can, I can relate to that. So what are we supposed to do with this? What, what do we do with this passage? How do we, it's not, it's not actually hard to understand the, the gen, in general terms what Paul is saying in these verses, but what, what use is it? How do we put it into work in our lives. Let me give you three things that you can do with this, that we should all do as Christians with this passage. The first thing is examine yourself by it. Use it to examine your own life. So if I ask you the question, do you love your kids? You'd say, yes, yes, I love them. But if I ask you, are you patient with your kids? What would you say? Well, sometimes, right? Because we're answering it based on how we feel about our children, not always what we do. Or if I ask you the question, do you love your spouse, do you love your wife, do you love your husband? Yes, I love him, I love her. If I ask you, well, are you ever resentful toward him, toward her? Are you keeping a record of wrongs? Well, sometimes. So let me give you uh, some questions. You know, in Psalm 139, the psalmist says, search me, O God, know my heart, test me, put me to the test, examine me, and see if there's any offensive way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. We should pray that prayer, and then use 1 Corinthians 13 as a, as a lens. James 1 tells us that the Word of God is a mirror and into which we look to get an accurate reflection of who God is and of who we are. So we can use 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7, 4 through 5, as a mirror. Let me give you seven questions you can ask for self-examination. There are more, but these seven might be helpful. You'll see them here at the bottom of the screen. First, where or with whom do I need to show more patience? Where am I impatient? Who do I need to show more patience with? Who do I need to take time to listen to? Who do you need to say, you know, I I need to have time for this person. They're worth my time. Number two, where or with whom do I need to show more kindness? Meaning not just be nice, but Right? It's goodness and usefulness put together. What can I do for you? How can I serve you? How can I help you? Where or whom or with whom do I need to show more kindness? Number three, where am I holding on to having my way? Where am I holding on to ha- need to have things my way? And may I need to let go of that. Number four, who am I tempted to envy? 
Is there anybody in your life that you're having a hard time celebrating their good fortune? Number five, where am I harboring any resentment in my heart? Keeping any lists these days? Got a record of wrongs done to you? Number six, where have I been tempted? Where have, excuse me, where have I been short-tempered or irritable? Where have I flown off the handle or lost my cool? And last, am I keeping a list or record of any wrongs done to me? These are not easy questions to ask ourselves honestly, but they're worth asking. And not just so that you can feel bad about yourself, but so you can do the second thing. The second thing, the way to use what to do with this passage is to strengthen your faith through it. Because inevitably, when you ask yourself those questions, you're going to start to feel like, oh, I'm not measuring up. I'm not living according to 1 Corinthians 13. I am not, if I'm honest, a very loving person by these definitions. So what do you do? How do you strengthen your faith through that? Because this is the character that God wants to produce in you. This is what God is after in your heart. This, the treatment can't begin. The doctor can't treat you until they diagnose what's wrong with you. They have to know what the disease is before they can address the cure. And don't forget, this is what God wants to do in you. So we ask ourselves the questions, we examine our hearts, not to feel bad and miserable about ourselves and walk around with this cloud of guilt, but <laughs> because God wants to change you. And Philippians 1.6 says, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. He who began a good work in you. God's going to do this. God's, this is God's agenda. This is what God wants. So you can pray. You ever wonder, how can I pray for the will of God? You can pray, God, change my heart. Make me patient. Make me kind. Make me less envious and boastful. Make me less self-centered. And you can know that, that is, you're praying in 100% alignment with the will of God for you. And Romans 5, verse 5 tells us, God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. God has poured his love into you. Poured it out. If God pours his love into your heart, into my heart, when we trust in Jesus, then this is the kind of person that you will become by his grace and with his help. Last, you can worship Jesus through it. So examine ourselves by it, strengthen our faith with it, and worship Jesus through it. When you read through 1 Corinthians 13, you know what we're really reading? You're reading a description of Jesus. You could replace the word love with Jesus. Jesus is patient. Jesus is kind. Jesus is not envious or boastful or self-seeking or rude. Jesus doesn't keep a record of wrong. He forgives freely. So when we read 1 Corinthians 13, we can worship the Lord and think about his kindness toward you, his patience with you, his humility. Philippians 2 tells us that he, that he laid down his, very, his rights, took on the nature of a servant, that he was willing to surrender those things, even on the cross, he was thinking about his father and those he came to save. Jesus is the answer to the question, what does love look like? So let's worship him as we pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you that even though we fall so far short of this passage, this remarkable passage which describes the love of your son, we acknowledge that God, this is why you came to save us not just to, to get us into heaven, but to get heaven into us, to change us, to transform us and form us into the image of your son. And so even though we fall short and we have plenty of places where we have a lot of growing to do, you are not done with us. We can be confident that you will carry it on to completion. And we thank you, Lord, that even as we read these words and we feel convicted, we can worship because this is a description of who you are and what you have done for us. And we rest in your perfect love for us. We thank you, Lord Jesus, and we praise you in your name. Amen.